good morning uh, to everyone, uh, or good afternoon to some, good evening to others. Um, welcome to the second of the th three days that we have in this uh, exciting uh, conference. Uh, my name is Nikos Vetas, uh, I'm speaking to you from Athens on behalf of the Foundation for Economic and Data Research that uh, is supporting and collaborating uh, this conference of the Rimini Center of Economic Analysis, uh, along with uh, the Tark Center in uh, Exeter and the University of Cyprus. Um, yesterday has been an exciting day, uh, full of uh, great papers, I have to say. Uh, on pretty much all areas from, from, from pure theory to, to very applied. Uh, I'm looking forward to have the same today and then uh, tomorrow. Uh, my job now and then I'm going to get out of the way so that we, um, we do not delay our uh, plenary, our keynote uh, speaker, uh, is just to thank um, a couple of institutions uh, and people uh, first of all, the, the Rimini Center for, for putting us um, under this uh, umbrella um, of a great organization, the collaborating institutions, our sponsors, without whom we wouldn't be able uh, to have the conference, everyone who worked very hard to produce an excellent program within a very tight uh, frame, including all the people in the uh, program uh, committee. Uh, I would like to um, separately thank uh, two individuals. Uh, one is uh, personally, on a personal uh, note, uh, one is Tassos Magdalinos, uh, and Tassos uh, got the idea of having this conference and has been um, uh, the, the brains and the heart behind it. Um, so uh, that, that's one. And uh, secondly, uh, Milkos Macris for uh, all of his contributions and insights uh, over the years, and especially the ones that he will produce uh, in the future. Uh, last but not least, uh, warm thanks to all the participants um, and uh, as I said before, I think it has been uh, uh, obvious that the level of the conference thus far has been uh, extremely high. Um, I will now going to uh, pass this uh, to Alessandra Luati, who is going to introduce um, Bojorno Alessandra. Uh, and um, who is going to um, introduce uh, our keynote speaker, uh, uh, Peter Phillips, and, uh, and, and run uh, the rest of the conference from now. Uh, so again, uh, thanks to everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Nico. I would like to join you thanking, uh, well, Tassos and Yanis and Karim and all of you, all the people involved. Uh, uh, in this conference. Um, well, it is a great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, uh, to this distinguished audience uh, this morning keynote talk that will be held by Peter Phillips. And it is usually difficult to summarize uh, in few words the scientific achievements and the scientific recognitions of uh, keynote speakers. But I have to say that this time with Peter, uh, to me, uh, it is actually nearly impossible. So wide is the range of contributions uh, uh, that Peter brought to economics, uh, to statistics, to econometrics, to time series. And so many are the recognition that uh, he got in his uh, bright career. So Peter Phillips is Professor of Economics and of Statistics at Yale University, and uh, he has position also in Auckland and Southampton, uh, also in Singapore, and previously in Birmingham and Essex. Um, is the editor of Economic Theory, uh, so we know, and uh, uh, even more, I'd like to uh, underline the fact that he's the founder of econometric theory. And this, in my view, witnesses uh, uh, Peter's effort uh, 
uh, in uh, uh, rigorous dissemination of uh, advances in uh, econometrics and in statistics. And we know all that his contributions on unit truth testing, co-integration, uh, asymptotic expansions, uh, let me say generalized functions, panel data, which I mean have been published in uh, econometric, a journal of econometrics, the review of economic studies, and I mean all the outlets, uh, I think they have more than 100,000 citations, but um, more importantly, uh, these are, are, are really milestones, these are references, and uh, well, as Peter is uh, uh, a source of inspiration uh, for all of us. So thank you very much, Peter, for being here with us today. I would uh, uh, leave the floor to you, and uh, you can then, uh, I guess, upload your presentation. You are talking about the robustness and co-integration. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Alessandra, for such a kind and most gracious uh, uh, introduction. It's uh, deeply appreciated. So uh, a very good morning uh, to uh, everyone, uh, certainly in Cyprus and uh, Athens, in Europe, more generally in the UK and in North America. And uh, good evening. <laughs> from New Zealand, uh, uh, I believe uh, my team is in Australia. There may be one or two others from Australia, so uh, good evening uh, to you as well. So uh, let me just reiterate the thanks that have already been uh, issued to uh, the organizers who've done a, a supreme job in such a short period of time, putting this uh, wonderful conference together for such a noble and important uh, cause. Um, that's terribly important uh, and it's deeply appreciated. And I uh, am uh, very appreciative of uh, the opportunity to uh, have this uh, keynote uh, presentation. So I'm just going to start by uh, sharing a screen with you by way of introduction. You can see in the background behind me is uh, a cityscape. Uh, I'll just blow that up on the uh, screen here. Uh, so I take it you can see this uh, screen now, is that right, Alessandra? And- Yes, that we see the screen. Okay, so that's a blow up and uh, uh, the Maori language, native language, uh, greeting to you all is tēnā uh, kotu, uh, tēnā kotu, tēnā koto katoa, which means greetings and best wishes to you all from this wonderful city, Auckland, New Zealand, and especially uh, best wishes to Miltos, uh, who I see has joined us. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, Task. So this city of Auckland uh, in the screen in front of you, you can see the uh, CBD uh, with the sky tower. And I took this uh, photograph from one of the 65 volcano cones that mark the topography of Auckland. And in the sweep around the uh, peninsula, you can see the multiple uh, city beaches um, in the Hauraki Gulf. This is the inner Hauraki Gulf, which uh, still are very swimmable. In fact, I had a swim there this afternoon myself. And on the other side of the peninsula, there are uh, two wonderful ocean beaches. And uh, there's a ferry uh, terminal here where I have marked it. And you cross the harbour in 12 minutes. Um, soon we'll have uh, electric ferries. Um, and then you walk up the hill uh, here towards the southeast and you walk up another volcano cone uh, to the University of Auckland. And uh, my daily activities uh, essentially involve that uh, journey from this suburb. And so uh, we hope very much that in the future, 
we'll see many of you out in New Zealand. We do run a conference here every year and they'll all be most welcome. So this is a talk uh, on multi-co-integration, which obviously relates to co-integration and linkages between non-stationary series. This particular talk uh, concerning multi-co-integration multi is really focusing on high dimensional features and the advantages of high dimensional instrumental variables in estimating systems of this uh, type. Of course, it's a very old topic. Uh, it goes back to the 1990s. Uh, and uh, the present work, which I spoke about in the preliminary talk at, uh, uh, in Cyprus uh, in 2019, which some of you may have attended, this uh, is now uh, the completed a version of that uh, talk with many new results. And some of the technicalities um, really took uh, almost a year to work out. So it's been um, a fairly uh, complicated endeavor. Uh, in any event, the uh, I should also mention that my co-author, Igor Kaifentz, um, was a postdoc student sitting in my class uh, when I set a take home exam, which was the very first version of this paper. And uh, he was the only student to uh, attempt it because there was an easier question. And uh, so subsequently we got together and um, wrote a preliminary paper, which came out in Journal of Econometrics on this subject just uh, last year, at the end of last year. And uh, this paper is really the more substantial uh, treatment showing how to uh, achieve rate efficiency in estimation with a very simple linear instrumental variable approach. So the main advantages is that we're using a high dimensional uh, instrumental variable approach that is robust to whether the system is either co-integrated or multi-co-integrated. That is, it deals automatically with any uh, long-run deficiencies associated with either co-integration or multi-co-integration in terms of the long-run uh, variance matrices. Um, and you get pivotal limit theory under both the multi-co integration environment and the co-integration environment. And of course, uh, being linear instrumental variables uh, with orthonormal instruments, it's extremely easy to, uh, to implement. So it has uh, these rather uh, useful advantages. The project isn't uh, fully complete yet because there are all sorts of potential extensions. Uh, but uh, I'll refer to those as we go along. So, as I mentioned here in this first slide, uh, multi co integration adds a level of complexity with an uh, additional degeneracy that leads to an additional level of co integration in a system. And it has its origins in the Granger uh, Lee work in terms of stock and flow systems where inventories, for example, are built up into stocks and then those aggregated variables co-link back with some of the original variables in the system. And in general, of course, one doesn't know the coefficients uh, in this um, linkage process. And so to anticipate some of the results, I'll just jump into a, a figure here that um, illustrates estimation with a very simple triangular system, as you'll see in the bottom panel, just a uh, two variable system with um, the traditional um, co-integration system, uh, whereby Y and X are co-integrated between uh, I1 variables. This whole talk will just deal with I1 and I2 and I0 and I minus one variables, um, quite a lot of this can be 
extended to the fractional case. But as we know, that leads to very substantial additional complications. And so I don't get into any of that here. So at the moment, uh, you notice that uh, the error on this equation has a moving average coefficient system, then that moving average could have a, um, a uh, moving average unit root, and that would lead to a degeneracy. And that's what produces the uh, uh, multi-co-integration. And this is a very, very simple way of explaining multi-co-integration compared with what's in the literature, at least in my view. So in this system here, we run some uh, simulations with standard uh, estimators like uh, fully modified least squares. This is a more recent integrated modified least squares, which is built on the FMLS principle and reduce rank. And then this um, IV approach, which I call trend IV when I developed it in the early 2000s. And uh, that's the method that we're actually going to be using throughout the system. And in the second multi-co-integrated framework, you'll notice that you get accelerated uh, rate of convergence here, an order n squared rate of convergence as distinct from the order n rate of convergence. And that's uh, because of the degeneracy that's induced by the presence of multi-co-integration. And you can see that uh, estimators like fully modified least squares and integrated modified least squares have bias in them. And this is a, a standard problem that arises in the use of traditional estimators and inference when a system happens to be multi-co-integrated. So uh, the prototypical example here is the production sales inventory, one that I alluded to, and stocks are obtained by accumulating inventories. And then of course, stocks themselves may be determined according to some uh, optimal inventory uh, framework such as this linear uh, adjustment system. And with that um, adjustment system, then you see that there's a linkage back between stocks and production. And if these basic variables, um, production and sales are I1 and inventories are I0, then when you accumulate it all, you get a relationship uh, such as the one in the final display here that connects I2, I1, and I0 error elements. And the I1 element is the uh, stocks. So we're effectively adding up equilibrium errors. And those equilibrium errors, when aggregated, uh, link up back to the original variables. And this can be tested using appropriately uh, created uh, critical values for a um, residual based test of the type that we develop for co-integration. So this framework you see from that final display uh, suggests that an I2 system is a natural context for co-integration. But of course, there's no reason to believe at the I1 level that this might occur. And so one could well estimate a co-integrated system without recognizing that there was multi-co-integration. A second example that's standard in the literature is housing stock and housing construction and recognition that not all starts actually are completed in the year. They may not ever be completed because of bankruptcy. There may be uh, construction delays, uh, difficulties with labor force, uh, and supply chain uh, problems, such as the ones the world's, uh, world's encountering now, which we're noticing uh, very substantially here in New Zealand, even though we produce a great deal of uh, framing timber in New Zealand, it's still in short supply <laughs> because the rest of the world wants it as well. And uh, our steel and other ingredients uh, for construction are subject to these um, supply chain constraints. So when we aggregate the uh, uh, housing stock that's under construction, we get another variable. 
and as we might expect, that uh, leads to a, a linkage at this higher level. This can all be written in levels and differences between I2, I1 and I0 components. And that's the way it's traditionally been done in the literature. So again, an I2 system seems natural. Now, some other examples that I won't get into here, but which should be mentioned are that because they're terribly important. The first, which I think is probably the most important is the global uh, climate change problem, where you have a uh, equilibrium earth energy balance uh, that um, leads to circumstances like the Holocene. Uh, and then one finds that when there's a, an imbalance between uh, radiation coming in from the sun and ra uh, radiation from irradiation from the center of the earth and uh, the outgoing infrared radiation, then that imbalance may accumulate and then it affects ocean warming and the entire system dependent on the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And uh, so that leads to a feedback mechanism through the aggregation of this imbalance in the uh, energy system. So that's terribly important. You get the same sort of imbalance with fiscal uh, sustainability or unsustainability with the accumulation of deficits into debt and then the feedback from debt uh, into economic activity. And similarly with um, consumption functions like the, the Tobin wealth effect and the consumption function. So you have consumption, income and wealth, which may have uh, I1 and I2 elements to them. So present wisdom uh, in the literature for a long time now has been that you really need to formulate this as a, a, an I2 system for the reasons that I've given. And that seems very reasonable as given in this quotation, but it's not actually true. It doesn't in any way affect uh, the presence of multi-co-integration in an I1 system, which is one of the main thematics of the talk, because it means that people can be estimating I1 systems without actually recognizing the presence of feedbacks from multi-co-integration. Uh, the Johansson and Engstead article uh, got it quite right on this point because they said that um, it's only in a VAR model that multi-co-integration cannot occur. And so my own work has been primarily with semi-parametric and non-parametric systems. And that's when I first noticed that um, this uh, indication that uh, multi-co-integration required an I2 system uh, wasn't accurate. On the other hand, as we saw in some of the accumulation equations in those economic uh, framework models, there are certain advantages to using I2 systems and we'll, we'll see that as we get along. So what does this paper do? Uh, first of all, we show it exists in an I1 system. Source of the singularity is really, uh, or the source of multi-co-integration multi is a singularity in the long run covariance matrices, particularly the conditional long run covariance matrix. And because it's not unusual to have moving average errors in, uh, in systems or near unit root moving averages in particular, then it's clear that you're going to get near degeneracies at this level. So we develop asymptotics for regression under such singularity. And we show that it's possible to robustify both the modeling and estimation and inference using these high dimensional trend IV uh, regressions. And in a way, uh, because this is a semi-parametric system, some of the coefficients in the system are non-parametric and you're actually estimating them as essentially non-parametric uh, uh, regression coefficients and you're doing so at a non-parametric not the usual non-parametric not the usual non-parametric rate which is less than order n this is at an order n rate so that's just a summary of what the system what the paper does and 
the framework that I'm using is this uh, triangular system, which most of you will be familiar with, where you have a uh, fundamental co-integrating relationship given by the first equation in this display. And then for simplicity, we just write down a, an I1 generating uh, regressor that's correlated, of course, over time and contemporaneously, usually uh, with this uh, regressor. And then because of this partitioning in the system, it's convenient mathematically to partition all the component uh, matrices. And when you uh, partition the long run uh, covariance matrix, which is this outer product of the long run moving average coefficients, then you can split it into two components, the long run variance matrix associated with the uh, regression errors, the UXs, and the conditional covariance matrix, um, which has this form here. And uh, in all the existing limit theory in the literature, we just conveniently assume that this long run conditional variance matrix is not a singular. And of course, what happens with multi co-integration is that it becomes singular. Now we have, of course, the error correction form, uh, which you can recast a triangular system of the type that we're using into that format. And then you can see that we get some of these differences uh, in the errors. And putting in system form, it's rather like a VAR1, but this is now a uh, non-parametric component. And uh, we can augment that regression by including the drivers of the explanatory variables. And this gives us uh, a system that involves levels and differences as well as errors. And because we're using a long run regression coefficient here, which is omega zero x, omega x, x inverse, it's just a standard regression coefficient, but cast in terms of the long run matrices. Uh, we get a simple system here um, that's still linear, but with an error that uh, has a long run variance matrix that's this critical conditional long run variance. Now, it's in this system here that we can get a potential breakdown. And uh, imagine a situation where this uh, matrix is singular of rank P less than MX, the number of regressors. So there's some matrix, non-parametric matrix H that annihilates that long run covariance matrix. And the primary implication is that in that direction of singularity, uh, we have a new equation in which because a long run variance matrix of this error in the augmented system is uh, zero in this direction, then in this direction, it will have to have a uh, zero spectrum at the origin which means that it's either a first difference or a fractional difference. So we are dealing with um, integer uh, levels of integration. So that means in this context that it's a first difference with the unit uh, uh, moving average root. So that means that we can write this system this way with a difference error. And if we apply partial summation to the system, we then get the I2 system. And so you can see immediately the linkage between that singularity in the long run covariance matrix and an I2 system. Now, of course, in our system here, this isn't a VAR because this is a general non-parametric error, weakly dependent error. But multi-co-integration in this form implies a linkage between cap y and cap x, which are the partial sums. That's the notation that I'm using. And uh, lowercase x, which is i1. And then 
presumably this will be I zero, but you could envisage even more complicated situations where this was singular as well, and then you had a higher order level of multi co integration. So we're not going to get into that level of complexity. So clearly, multi co integration exists in an I1 system, then it has an I2 representation. And uh, the corresponding semi parametric error correction system, which is the one that we gave earlier, but taking into account the new form of the error involves a difference here. And so when you take the long run variance of the error, which is given in red in that uh, first display, then you get the long run conditional covariance matrix uh, supplemented in this block diagonal system by the uh, long run variance uh, of X or the innovations X. So that's the non-invertible moving average uh, components. So uh, standard methods uh, of uh, estimation can be employed. So I've gone through that slide fairly uh, quickly because you're all pretty familiar with these methods or those of you who are econometricians. So we have our system here uh, under multi integration, we have that formulation. And because of that uh, first difference error, uh, we actually get a, a, a rise in the convergence rate. Uh, this is a standard uh, feature of uh, systems that are estimated with uh, unit uh, uh, root moving average errors. And so fully modified least squares converges uh, when you just step standardly estimate that by fully modified least squares, it has a higher uh, a convergence rate. And the paper that uh, Igor and I uh, published in Journal of Econometric Studies that case. But unfortunately, fully modified least squares suffers second or bias effects as it isn't mixed normal limit distribution, except in special circumstances. That's true of all the other methods as well. So that's the fundamental difficulty that inference immediately breaks down, even though you get a higher order rate of consistency. Now, one of the most interesting things I discovered is that uh, the magical procedure that uh, Tassus, Magdalenus and I uh, suggested uh, about nearly 15 years ago now, uh, IVX, um, which creates instruments with a lower order of um, uh, integration, uh, they're what we call mildly integrated. Um, those uh, procedures actually have wonderful properties in this uh, setup. Uh, so IVX is not only magical in dealing with the problems that uh, some researchers have complained about existing co-integrating methods breaking down because XT doesn't have a perfect unit root, or it may be local to unity, or it may be mildly integrated. And then the traditional methods of inference break down because there's a lot of bias in inference. But IVX resolves those problems uh, rather magically and leads to mixed normal limit distributions. And so it's being used uh, a little more extensively now, particularly in uh, financial econometrics. Uh, courtesy of a major paper that Tassus wrote uh, with some of his co-authors and former students. Um, now, in this case, um, even with a singularity in the uh, long run covariance structure, it still works, uh, which is great. And uh, even if the variance matrix itself fails, it continues to work. So, I don't uh, spend any time talking about this uh, in the uh, paper. I uh, might have mentioned it in a, a line or two somewhere or another, but it's something that uh, you know I'm exploring and uh, is actually rather interesting. So it is consistent and it turns out to have a faster rate of consistency and it is mixed normal, but other methods actually give a faster rate and they're rate efficient relative to IVX. 
But again, that's not uh, uncommon because IVX, we know, get, gains its um, magical robustness by lowering the order of integration deliberately. So there's a very recent method uh, suggested by uh, Vogelsang and Wagner uh, called integrated modified least squares. And what they suggest is just partial summing the entire system to raise the order of it. So again, using capitals to denote uh, a further partial sum process. And then here, the error on such an equation, this is really the uh, aggregated system of the um, augmented regression equation we had earlier. That uh, error I denote by E plus, and E plus has two options, uh, depending on whether there's singularity in the long run covariance matrix. And in one case, it's um, an I1 error, which is capital U. Uh, and in the other case, it's a stationary error. Now, in the Vogelsang Wagner article, um, they had this non-stationary error. And you can see that this makes that regression a spurious regression, as I remark here, because that's the error. And that causes some real difficulties with respect to constructing a suitable uh, inferential procedure. In fact, one of the procedures that they suggested was to use FMOLS, traditional FMOLS, to help in estimating the covariance structure. So although that method has some really interesting properties, it also suffers a spurious regression problem. And then in the singular case, uh, IMOLS suffers endogeneity problems, serial correlation problems, just like uh, the other procedures that I've mentioned. So uh, you can see here that in the co-integrated case, IMOLS, just like FMOLS, has this type of limit theory that we're familiar with. And when, and I'm dealing with a single equation here, that's why I'm just writing this conditional variance matrix as zero. It raises the order to n squared. Uh, so that is actually rate efficient, but you can see that there's all sorts of additional complexities here uh, from endogeneity and bias that uh, those of you who are familiar with this line of research will be uh, familiar with. The trend IV procedure that uh, um, we're going to use throughout uh, the rest of this talk is uh, based on a method that uh, I introduced really um, in the paper in 1998, uh, but then explored really fully in 2004-2005, and that's to just take uh, deterministic trends, sinusoidal trends in particular work well, and um, you can take K of them so that you've got a finite number of instrumental variables and their orthonormal series as instruments, and you just project all the data on that. The great advantages I showed in this paper in 2006 is that when you project the data on that, you actually end up with uh, a Gaussian process. That's been used in a lot of the uh, low frequency uh, econometric work that you've seen in the literature in the last 10 years or so. And that's uh, associated with what we call fixed K inference because you just have a fixed K set of uh, trend instruments. They could be polynomials, K order polynomials, you regress on that. And because these are deterministic, you get very straightforward limit theory in terms of the limiting properties of this data, which you know by functional laws will be asymptotically Gaussian. That makes this Gaussian. And then as I suggested in the 2006 paper, you can set up a likelihood function that deals directly only with those trend components. And uh, when you do that, you get the sort of procedures that have been discussed uh, in the more recent literature. However, um, in the earlier paper in 98, and certainly in this paper, I point out that there are real advantages gained by high dimensional trend regression. 
uh, those advantages turn out to be absolutely critical in this uh, framework here. So, in the, yes. I'm sorry, this is Alessandro. There's 10 minutes left. Oh, yes. Thank you very much. I'll try to keep to that, uh, Alessandro. Thank you. Perhaps you'll mention it when it becomes five. Yeah, four, I will. Three, I will. two, one. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, we go back to this fully augmented system. And uh, the secret is that just like the way we augmented the traditional regression system that was an I1, we just augment it with a difference here, just as we did in the original system. And uh, so formally that has this uh, form and uh, we've got a composite error just as before. And then you apply TIV, trend IV, with deterministic instruments. Um, and that's equivalent to just transforming the model, as I indicated, to get Gaussian variables. And that's where all the great advantages come from. So estimation of the co-integrating vector is really trivial. We just set up the system and do instrumental variables, which we can do iteratively. And then we, you know, first project on one set of variables, then project on the other. And then we get the corresponding coefficient that we're interested in, which is the co-integrating coefficient A. The multi-co-integrating coefficient is this one here that links back into the system uh, the um, original variables through a feedback. And then if you want to estimate the co-integrating vector, then you do the repeated instrumental variable regression in reverse. It's a two-stage projection. Everything gets projected onto the instruments. And uh, again, it's just a very simple IV regression. So this is very straightforward. And because the orthonormal functions give us this rather nice property, then it's really just uh, asymptotically ordinarily squares on this transformed system with asymptotically normal variables. And this is where so many of the advantages come from. So uh, there are two types of asymptotics you can look at, fixed K asymptotics and joint asymptotics as K and as N go to infinity. And we have to put, as expected, some sort of control on the expansion rate of K. Now, the fixed K approach has achieved some sort of uh, uh, popularity in the literature because in very simple co-integrated systems, it leads to, um, uh, they're not exact, but they're exact when these normal asymptotics take over. So you can see when the normal asymptotics take over, everything here is normal. And that then means that it's uh, when you construct T tests and wall tests, they're just like uh, uh, T distributed and uh, F distributed test statistics. So that's attracted quite a lot of attention and improvements have been noted from that. However, um, that doesn't always work and it fails badly in the current uh, situation. So uh, fixed K asymptotics lead to this type of uh, limit theory. And you do get some mixed normality and under certain conditions, namely when there's no endogeneity, then you get some nice properties, but it's a very strong uh, condition to uh, rule out um, endogeneity. However, uh, the they can be dealt with, but of course there are real complications making those adjustments, as we know from fully modified least squares, for example. So uh, with uh, trend IV, you just let K go to infinity and you get these mixed normal asymptotics at both levels. You get order N asymptotics here and you get order N squared asymptotics here. And I, this is not only rate efficient, uh, I believe that it's also uh, fully efficient uh, with respect to um, uh, maximum likelihood. And so, of course, you get convenient mixed normal asymptotics. 
And you can do uh, inference, uh, such as um, wall testing in a straightforward way. And the great advantage here is that you just set up the wall statistic in the conventional fashion. And the, interestingly, the covariance structure is precisely the covariance structure that you would use with either a hack estimate or a um, fixed B um, you know, um, covariance, uh, long run covariance estimator. And these are specified in the final two displays. But under the null, the centered estimates basically look like this. And you've got to deal with this uh, dual error here, dual because it uh, has one form, uh, namely non-stationary under the uh, co-integration setting when there's no multi-co-integration and stationarity under multi-co-integration. And yet the fascinating thing is that um, when you set up this T or wall statistic, um, especially using a fixed B estimate. And the fixed B estimate, as you know, the Vogel's and uh, Kiefer uh, idea is to include all the data with an appropriately weighted kernel. And you just set it up in exactly the same way as you would normally. And you use exactly the same formula, whether the system's multi-co-integrated or simply just co-integrated. So what this means is that you would do this without even knowing whether the system was multi-co-integrated. And, um, and you get null asymptotics under co-integration for the fixed B choice, but not uh, for the... Um, the conventional hack estimate where you've got a fixed m here or an m going to infinity at a slower rate than n. So you get a divergent walled statistic here. So this is a case where you get a real material advantage from using the fixed b approach. I'm not sure that there are many other examples uh, like that. So uh, there's a real advantage to using that fixed B approach in this context. And because that's a projection matrix, it only depends on the rank. And the rank is just the number of restrictions in the system that you're testing. And uh, it's dependent also on the number of uh, regressors. And the number of regressors influences all of these um, Brownian motions that are projections on the other subvariates which reflect the projection processes in the construction of the estimator itself. And so in fact, this is just a pivotal limit theory. And precisely the same thing applies under multi-co-integration. Peter, Again, you get two it. minutes left, sorry. Okay, very good. Uh, so you get exactly the same under multi-co-integration. And so a pivotal limit theory, and that pivotal limit theory means that you can uh, do inference. And so alternative asymptotics apply, and you get order one uh, local, uh, order one over n uh, local behavior under the alternative order one upon n squared local behavior with a random non-centrality uh, matrix uh, or coefficient. So critical values can be obtained by bootstrap because it's asymptotically pivotal. Um, or you can, of course, pretest one way or another. So just a few simulations. You saw the um, diagram initially. And then if you compare it with reduced rank regression, you can see this is uh, trend IV, the, the dashed blue line. And the uh, dashed uh, red line is reduced rank regression, which actually turns out to be very similar to ordinary least squares. So you can see the consequences of multi-co-integration there. So size and power, well, the size is actually pretty stable, um, whether you're dealing with a co-integrated system or a multi-co-integrated system. I've just given a, a short abstract of these um, 
um, tables that are in the paper. And power is uh, actually pretty accurate. Power goes down as fixed B uh, value approaches one, which is a standard phenomenon. So uh, I think given that I have limited time, uh, I'll just, there is an empirical uh, example that um, that'll be in the paper for those of you who want to look at it. So just to summarize, um, you can see that multi-core integration is something that does happen uh, even in I1 co-integrated systems, but it's best not to use the traditional methods of estimation, but uh, methods such as IVX and trend IV uh, seem to work pretty well. Um, and I think IVX will have some additional advantages that trend ID do not have, simply because we know that it works with mildly integrated processes as well. And uh, trend ID gives robust estimation with those rate efficient um, rates, which are you know, pretty important relative to IVX. So only simulation studies will, will show the benefits uh, that can be gained by using IVX relative to trend IV. And the simple thing that we do is just augment the regression equation either with uh, XT or delta XT in order to achieve this uh, simple thing. So I'll just end with this. Um, it's interesting that in the Maori language, saying goodbye is the same as saying hello and greeting. So, tina koto, tina koto, tina koto kato. Goodbye, everyone, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Peter.